Some of this touches me a little close to home. When I started doing the research on eugenics, I found my own family. So it's still a touchy thing for us to talk about. So um, we're gonna start, um, and if you didn't hear me, the left side of your folder has just some really good information to work, if you're ever working with an Abenaki, the do's kind of and the nots, because not everybody understands that. And then there's a pre-assessment, that's for you guys, not for me. There's a post, that's for you guys, not for me. And I'm hoping when you do the post, you'll have different answers so that you've learned something. Or maybe something's changed your mind a little bit throughout this. So the idea would be, do it soon. You know, ideally it'd be like before you actually do the training, but then after. And then every couple of months, just get a sense for yourself. You know, how, how are you doing with this? One of the things I just want to say before Brenda starts, she and really everyone is just wearing that into political correctness. So this is not about political correctness, but it is about learning the Abenaki culture, and that's really important. But when you see that first questionnaire, I can't for you. It's not for us to do anything. But Brenda, you do have the evaluations in that group program. I gave them the evaluation, I just did. So everything that I talk about is nothing that is just um, something that I heard. Everything that is on here is there. So any kind of documentation that you want is on the tables. Feel free to look at anything. I didn't make copies for everybody because I'm not going to kill the planet by doing all the trees. But there is all kinds of resources that you can go on. But nothing I talk about will be anything that's not a fact today. So. And I broke my glasses, so Anna had to buy me a new pair today. Yes. All right, let's move. All right. So the ground on which we stand is sacred ground. It is the dust and blood of our ancestors. Who are we? St. Francis Sokoki Band of the Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi. We have the second largest burial ground east of the Mississippi. Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi is a Native American tribe and First Nation located in Swanton, Vermont. Documented residents for over 14,000 years. And this map just shows you pretty much where all the Abenaki are. And it's all the way up through Maine, from Vermont right through into Maine. This was tribal headquarters. It used to be the old depot. Um, in 1972, Homer St. Francis and others drafted our constitution, establishing Missisquoi. In 1976, tribal opened doors. 1978 law. We were here before that. So I don't want you to think just because the Constitution was drafted in 1972 that our people weren't here. It's just because they were in hiding because of eugenics. And this was the time when they were first coming back out to say who they were. And I can only talk about Missisquoi today. I can't talk about the other three tribes. I don't know it. <coughs> this is Miles Jensen. Um, Jeff, do you want to do your little Miles spiel? Was, uh first director of um, the Abenaki Self-Help Association. He was from Rhode Island. He was a, uh, a, a Narragansett uh, native who came here, and uh, he was critical when the Abenaki Self-Help got started. Um, he actually uh, recruited me and was my mentor. And unfortunately, uh, Miles died of a massive coronary in 1991. But when we look at the people that are the seminal people around the tribe, um, certainly uh, we look at Miles Jensen and then Brenda's gonna talk about Blackie Lyman and in particular Homer St. Francis, but yeah. Miles is right there. So That's Miles Jensen. And we believe in our nation when things are unearthed, people get sick, our people die. Out of the ordinary, people just drop dead. So when things are unearthed, it's so important for us to make sure things are repatriated, to make sure that it's put back because sickness happens to our people. And Miles was one. This is um, Phil, um, Richards. He, Jeff, you want to do that little spiel? Real quick. So Richard Phillips was an elder, and uh, he was on one of the first members of the Tribal Council. And the Tribal Council got started in 72. Richard Phillips was one of the original uh, uh, Tribal Council members. Somehow, uh, the Newsweek magazine had heard about Richard Phillips. He used to do rain dances and snow dances. They got a hold of him, and uh, Vermont had had no snow for like a long stretch. They hired Richard Phillips. He did a snow dance, and the next day, we got an incredible storm. So Richard Phillips was on the cover of Newsweek Night. Three of these. He runs a church now on uh, the other side of the line. This is um, a community member. 
His name was Alan St. Francis. We lost him last year, I believe it was. But I just want to put some pictures up so you get faces and see who we are. And that's Maddie Maskell. That's Anne's grandfather, uncle, grandfather. 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 So the Wabanaki lands and the tribes that lived through the early 18th century. So it goes from the Pequot all the way up through to the Mi'kmaq over to there. And like I said, we're pretty much from the whole area. Um, the thing is, into Canada, but remember, there was no borders. We didn't have borders. It wasn't like you had to go through border and go through and show us any kind of ID. You just kind of crossed. Missisquoi territory within the larger territory of the Western Abenaki. So um, what's green is pretty much what's Missisquoi. Missisquoi is us. Missisquoi is us. Kawasuk's a small group. The Pentecost's down the bottom part of New Hampshire. But we're all within um, the Abenaki people. This is a picture I found, and it's a, um, it's a wigwam. And it was uh, called the Wickwam. And people actually went there to eat and um, have beverages and stuff. And it was down in Highgate Springs. And we're, I don't know if you guys know the area, but Tyler Place, the area where all that, that was our land. That was everything that we had. And um, it was just part of you, everything being taken. But this used to be there, and people would gather. And if you look, most of them um, look more like us than probably other others. Is that yep. yep. So Native American Indians are the only race in North America that has to legally prove race within European enforced government documentation. No other race of people who came to our homeland has to do this to prove their race, not blacks, not whites, not Asians, or anyone else. And that's pretty powerful to think that we're the only people that have to prove who we are. If you're 1% black, you are black. If you're 1% um, Asian, you are considered Asian. But we have to prove who we are under European law. Native ceremonies were considered a crime that were punishable imprisonment until the Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978. So in my lifetime, when I was being taught to dance, we did it in hiding. We didn't do it out and about because it was against the law. And they could have arrested our parents. So when I was taught to dance by Denny Abumswin, I was 12 to 14 years old at the old tribal building that I showed you. We were in the back room, and we learned how to do the dances within a couple weeks. And then he went back to Odenak. But everything was done there because that we were sovereign in our own area. Funny how everybody likes the Indian that talks about earth, the water, harmony, feathers, and spirit animals. But nobody likes to talk about the Indian that talks about the invasion, terrorism, murder, genocide, plundering, and rapes by the settlers. When your people came to our land, it was not with open arms, but with Bibles and guns and disease. You took our land, you killed us with your guns and disease, and then you had the arrogance to call us the godless savages. And that's in textbooks. Believe me. What if I informed you that 13,000 Native Americans fought in World War I without US citizenship? That's a really hard thing to think about, that our people didn't have citizenship. Native Americans are the most enlisted demographic in the military. Native Americans also receive the least amount of benefits and compensation from veterans' affairs. That has changed in the last year since I've done this, but they're still not at what everybody else gets. In 1759, St. Francis Raid, which was our called Missisquoi Massacre, right here, in Adakana. Rogers Rangers, the White Devil, and if you ever come to my Circle of Courage program, the kids know him as the White Devil. He raided Missisquoi Village before dawn on October 3rd, killing over 500. Rogers claimed to kill 200, mostly women, elders, and children. Robert Rangers, Rogers had disguised himself as a native and entered the village saying he was Mohegan. Rogers Rangers took some of the natives captive. So he went and he, he stole some regalia from another tribe. He worked his way into our people. And then he found out when the men were leaving. The men were leaving to go hunting, which left our children, elders, and our women vulnerable. And that's when they came in and raided and murdered our people. So people understand practice. I mean, one thing that's so hard when we're trying to talk about history is not uh, revision history, but 
we're trying to do accurate portrayals. But we're talking about uh, maybe you guys are too young. Uh, there's a movie with uh, Spencer Tracy and Robert Young, Northwest Passage. Northwest Passage is uh, the rendition, the Hollywood rendition of Roger's Rape. And, and, and it's something that glorifies them. So people growing up, I grew up, and I always thought that these guys were really cool. Uh, it, was, it wasn't cool for the Abenaki because the Abenaki side on the losing side, on the side of the French. Uh, but, the, but the thing is, that's where it, it's so hard when you've got people that have grown up with these stereotypes in mind, and then you say, but that's not really what it was all about. And this is a good example of it. Really, I'm one of the better. I have a, a pamphlet on him, anyhow, in your folder that you can read on. Oh, no. What's going on? The Indians of Vermont are the St. Francis Band of the Western Abenakis. The tribe traces its ancestry to a village along the Missisquoi River near present-day Swanton. It's always been Indian territory. So we always lived there. Can you hear that all right? They had a massacre there, they moved back into the woods, and they came back out when it was out of the sea. And you see, we lived kind of right ourselves, so we can just float right in and nobody even noticed. Homer St. Francis is the Abenaki chief. Elected in September 1987, he also served as the tribe's first modern chief following the reestablishment of the tribal council in 1972. Uh, we've been here 12,000 years before Christ, so that ought to be long enough, I, I think. And if it isn't, maybe we can dig back a little further. I don't know. Unlike many other Native Americans, Vermont's Abenakis are not federally recognized, and the tribe has no treaty with the United States. After European conquest, some Abenakis fled to the woods along the river and spent nearly 250 years living an Aboriginal lifestyle. Others intermarried with French Canadians and, passing for white, assumed a sedentary life in the towns. Professor William Haviland of the University of Vermont has traced their ancestry. There have been people living here in the Missisquoi Valley for 11,000 years, and a few years ago we did a, a survey of that other bank over there for the wildlife refuge and found where the rare remains, I mean, stuff from about uh, zero AD going all the way up to about the time of contact, uh, obviously an uh, important part of the old Missisquoi uh, village site. Now, in more recent times, the 19th century and the early part of this century, all of this refuge here was, was heavily wooded, uh, uninhabited, and a lot of uh, Indians, Abenakis, uh, lived back in the woods and uh, pursued a traditional lifestyle of hunting, fishing, and basically stayed away from the settled areas. Uh, but when the wildlife refuge was established, why then the Abenakis that were operating in the area could no longer pursue their, their traditional hunting and, and fishing because uh, you know, suddenly they're, they're confronted with uh, federal uh, fish and game officials. That confrontation between the Abenakis and those officials continues today. In October 1987, the tribe held a fish-in to force the state to make a determination of their fishing rights. Yeah, I purchased 
not to eat, but we got commercial fishermen there that uh, fishes all the time. Nobody even bothers them. You got you let them eat it down there. They they want to take take it to court. Twenty five thirty five dollars fine. There he's trying to provide for his family, and here they are trying to lock him up. They don't need licenses. This is their land, and they're enforcing their laws on my people. And to me, that's going to stop. We'll enforce our own laws on our own people, on our own land. St. Francis also charges harassment from the local police who keep a close watch on tribal functions, which they claim are often marked by disturbances. So 77 of my people were cited for court that day. So I do have that. Um, it's the, stir the state um, paperwork if anybody wants to look at it. So it's considered state versus Elliot. And um, needless to say, it took 33 years later, June 25th of 2020, before the fishing and hunting bill of H716 for the Abenaki people to fish and hunt free in the state of Vermont. Nothing came, nothing came easy for any of us in Missisquai. We have fought forever for everything that we possibly could do. This alone, hunting and fishing, was a succeed, but 33 years later. The idea here was after 1976 when Thomas Hammond was governor and he granted the Abenaki recognition on Activity Day 1976. Richard Snelling came in and rescinded it on January 21st, 1977. The only way you can get state recognition is three ways, either through a governor, through a proclamation, a gubernatorial proclamation, then through the uh, judiciary, and then through the legislative branch. We knew that uh, once Salmon said yes, and Snelling rescinded that uh, we're never gonna go that way again. So what's open is judiciary or what's open is legislative. At that time, there was literally, virtually no support for the Abenaki. Hundreds of the House members, 30 senators, nobody supported the Abenaki. Uh, but it was worse than not just supporting, I mean, it was outright nastiness. So we knew we couldn't do that. So the only thing left was going the route of what the judiciary. And what we decided was, what Homer and others realized was that, okay, everything, and this is really important, everything ever undertaken was done in the name of civil disobedience. So as much as people thought of Homer St. Francis was a hooligan doing this kind, nothing further from the truth in terms of the Abenaki uh, and the Abenaki strategies. So it was, first off, hunting, fishing, we thought, okay, going with the fishing, fishing without licenses. And as Brenda said, 77 people were cited. This then became the genesis of the state versus Elliot. The state of Vermont took the Abenaki to court, and what happened was something really interesting. Every local court case, and some of you might know, the name Howard Van der Theisen, who's a judge now, uh, I think he might have just retired. Howard Van der Theisen was uh, the state's attorney in Franklin County. So Howard was representing the state. Uh, the Abenaki had to present. The Abenaki would get on for two weeks, present their case in terms of why they should have Aboriginal under the um, The state would then come on, and Howard and Howard Van der Theisen would not call anyone. He'd simply say, we don't feel the Abenaki have done an adequate job of proving Aboriginal hunting and fishing. He would sit down. Every court decision ruled in favor of the Abenaki. Now, Marilyn Cunin was the governor, and this would be the front pages of every, like, calling the free press, let's say that, the Abenaki won, the Abenaki won. It's then making itself, you know, it's, it's making itself uh, going up and up higher until we're dealing with some of the justices. A guy like uh, Joseph Walchek, who was one of the most brilliant uh, judges in the history of Vermont, ruled in favor of the Abenaki. The next person uh, was Frank Mahady. Frank Mahady was gonna be appointed by Mount Hughes to the Supreme Court. We found out that uh, he had somebody working for him and he wasn't taking taxes out, uh, someone who was cleaning his house and stuff. He couldn't become a Supreme Court justice. However, Frank Mahaney ruled in favor of the Abenaki. So at that point, everybody was convinced this is going to happen. Because we figured if it's winning in every lower court case, it's certainly going to win at the Supreme Court. The state was panic stricken because it looked like the Abenaki were winning. Here's what happened. The, um, Madeline Cunin uh, had a press set with him. His name was John Dooley. John Dooley was also a lawyer. There was an opening on the Supreme Court. Maybe he didn't take it, so we didn't get it. So listen to this. 
uh, Dewey becomes the next person on the Supreme Court. So John Dewey went from being press secretary from Mount Union to becoming a Supreme Court justice. He got out to the Supreme Court and we thought we might have problems, but we didn't expect what followed. Every time in lower court, we're talking decisions that took weeks and weeks for them to be filed. Uh, Brenda's got uh, some of them, the Elliott decision. You'll see uh, legal briefs that are like this, that the state against the Abenaki at the Supreme Court level, um, it took two days to come back. Uh, and it was this literally one page. It was what was called the increasing weight of history. Now, that's still taught in law school today, at Vermont Law School. The increasing weight of history rules against the Abenaki. Recognition uh, and the entire judiciary case was shut down. So that was it. So with that, um, it was like all the curtains. The only way to deal with that was then going to be through uh, the legislative branch. And legislatively, it took from that time, you know, literally we'll talk about the 1980s until 2006, 2007. That's how long it took before there was a sense that we had the legislators, you know, who were going to be, you know, looking favorable. But that's how many years it took. And then, of course, you know the rest. Uh, recognition did not. But that's the path to recognition. And the one thing you get about that, incredibly, is the resiliency of the Abenaki. I mean, I don't know. It was unbelievable to look through that and to see time after time after time, they're getting shot down and shot down and shot down and shot down. And yet they kept coming back for more and said, we know who we are, we feel it here, and we're going to do whatever we have to do. This is with very little money, very little resources. Well, we had lawyers that were doing pro bono work. We had archaeologists, people like Bill Hatler and others doing pro bono work because they believe in what the Abenaki were wanting to do. And that brings us literally to the here and now. But that's what it was like, and that's what it took. Okay, so these are just some pictures from 1987. Um, Bev Ramo, she was an elder, and uh, her children and I went to school together, and we learned the dancing and everything together. Indian Education and the Parent Advisory Committee. The Parent, Parent Advisory Committee was established in 1981. The PAC oversees all programs and activities. College of Missisquoi, fall of 1998. Kindergarten was only private school. Abenaki started the first kindergarten in 1984 out of the armory of Swanton, Vermont. In 1986, made it for all children to have kindergarten in public schools. 1993, Parent Advisory Committee decided decided to start the Learning Center, which ran for seven years. So this is, a, this is Jeff, some elders that aren't with us anymore, but this was a pack. This is Anne, who's with us today. She's been on the pack for probably 35, 40 years. Indian Education and Parent Advisory Committee. Um, 2000, the Abenaki Circle of Courage began. That's what I, I run. Mrs. Goy Mentoring Program, which got so big that it's not even, and, and we gave it to another um, organization. Mrs. Goy Health Center in 2000, which we had for a while, and then that went to the Bayside. Everything we seem to get seems to be taken. It never seems to fail. So when we don't trust people, they wonder why. They give you an inch, we take it, we work for it, we do what we need to do, and then before you know it's gone. UVM Abenaki Summer Happening has been for over 30 years giving youth opportunity to stay on campus and experience college life. And that is to try to help our kids to decide that there's more to life to go on to college. And not college for all kids. We understand some want trade. Some just want a job. But they got to have some kind of guidance. Guide to College and Scholarship we created for the Abenaki students. Um, it was developed by the PAC. I'm president of the Parent Advisory Committee also. In 1982, a needs assessment was done of heads of households of the Abenaki community with findings 70% of dropped out of school, 50% before ninth grade. Fewer than 5% of Abenaki kids did anything after post-secondary. We always look at the outcomes enough to say we are running programs. We wanted communities to know how affected they were. Currently, our dropout rate is less than 3%. Approximately 35 to 38 go on to post-secondary schools, including two and four years uh, college and technical school. We are very proud of that for where we came and where we are. Um, we always had an issue with our superintendent. He's, he'd make comments in the paper that he's the only principal that had 
the only principal at the time, and then he was our superintendent that had to deal with the Abenaki. So every time the school was not sufficient in graded scores, he always came back to the Abenaki. Well, we showed him because our scores were at new high and we did well where the others didn't do as well. So he had to retract his statement. So just to understand, it was that this was Jack McCarthy who basically said that uh, at that time test scores were disaggregated. Uh, 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 free and reduced hot lunches, disabilities, things like if you had over 30 people in a subgroup, you were counted. Well, in this area, in the Abenaki, there were over 30 people. Um, they should have been, let's say, in places like Burlington, where you had African-American presence, but somehow that didn't happen. So um, in this area, um, you get the test scores and you see, oh, wow, the Abenaki, uh, they didn't cut, they the grade. Uh, so what happens is you're identified. Um, and what Brenda's referring to is that uh, the Abenaki were identified. And uh, McCarthy made the statement that uh, um, we get a triple whammy. We got poor kids, we got kids with disabilities, and we have the Abenaki. And it, it came out in a way that made it look like you know, he was feeling real badly that he had the Abenaki. Of course, the next day in the messenger, there was a retraction. Um, and what Brenda said is absolutely true. The Abenaki were the first uh, ethnic group uh, in the Northeast to come off of that, the identified list, because test scores increased significantly. Right. But you got to know, our, our kids, our kids were um, accounted, they could be counted three times because one, they were Abenaki, two, they had a 504, a 504 plan or an IEP, and God forbid they were poor. So that child would be counted three times, where the others would only be counted as one. So. Abenaki Circle of Courage. Our four core values, mastery, to do the best I can, to believe in myself and believe I can succeed. Belonging, I am loved, we are family, and we are accepted. Independence, teaching free will, and to be able to stand up for yourself. I have the power to make a difference. Generosity, concerns for others, and know that they have a purpose in life. Those are our four goals that I work with, with kids from kindergarten to sixth grade, and then seventh through twelfth are volunteers that come to Circle. And um, I had a little kid the other day, yesterday, his kindergarten, and we were talking about the art show, and he was afraid his artwork wasn't going to be shown. And I said, well, of course it'll be shown. He said, well, at school they only pick the good ones. And I said, well, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. Mastery is the best you can do. So, our kids have been everywhere. We've, we travel, we've been to New York, we've been to New Hampshire, we've been to Massachusetts, we've performed at the Flynn Theater. We've sold out three, uh, three days of shows within a matter of hours when our kids were on stage. And I am traditionally a traditionalist. So if I'm taught a dance a certain way, I'm not gonna change it for you or anybody else. So when the Flynn wanted us to come in on the, right side instead of the left side, and they want us to shorten the dance, I said, we can pack up and go home. And they decided, well, I guess she's not gonna budge. I'm not changing our ways. We do everything to the left, it's closest to our heart, and, um, and we do the dance as long as it's supposed to be. So these are just some of the areas of the kids. So like I said, it's open K through six. I actually have a preschooler, which is my granddaughter, and uh, she's very involved, just like the other kids. Um, it's open, it's free to every student. Not all my kids are Abenaki, which I believe is important because if we can teach one kid or two kids that aren't and they can take it home and they can share it with others, it's being taught and that's important. My volunteers are seventh through 12th grade. They sign a pledge with me, purity, no drugs, alcohol or tobacco. That is crucial because nothing we do is ceremonial that is ever supposed to have those incorporated in it. So today, I hope this gets taken out, but today I said something about sativa <laughs> and I didn't even realize it came out of my mouth, but um, Josh let me know. So um, anyhow, we don't, that isn't part of, so that came out by accident. But So our flag raising ceremonies at the local schools was 2013 MVU. And that was a big day for me. I went to MVU. And I was one of the students when Leanne Babby was the principal. And there was books of history. And they talked about the St. Francis Sokoki savages. And we were upset about it. So instead of him being a principal and doing what he should have did, he humiliated us. He called us to the theater. And at that time, it was in the middle of where Commons is. And there was no walls. So you could see in when you stood there. And he had all the books thrown on the floor. And he threw markers and told us what we didn't like to cross up. That's how we were treated. 
So elementary schools in 2019 and last fall, we did Alberg, which was amazing also. Because the islands is Nadakana also for our people. And that means our homeland. These are my kids. And I do call them mine. When they're with me, they are mine. Um, parents know when they're with me, they're safe, that nobody's going to get them. If you think you're coming to pick a kid up and you don't have permission, you ain't getting those kids. Um, the kids travel. We go places. We used to go to the powwow down in Whitehall, New York. And uh, we got to actually raise money and stay in a hotel with the kids. And the kids actually got to go swimming at the end of the day. It was big things for them to do, because these are things they don't always get to do. So we try to incorporate fun things also, so that they're, they're wanting to stay involved and they're wanting to do. So this was out of powwow. The kids were actually drumming for everybody, which is an honor, because kids usually aren't asked to do that. But our kids, our youth, work really hard every Wednesday. And by the time the end of the year, they're prepared to do that, where it's usually adults. A totem pole ceremony, Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019, Swanton School. 2020 was at the park in Swanton. Um, our children, our youth, performed for both drumming. Um, the Abenaki uh, Circle of Courage students travel around the state and bordering states to perform and teach Abenaki culture. Like I said, we've been places as the Flynn Theater, Echo, the 13 indigenous grandmothers when they came to, they were coming to the state and they would not come here without permission. And that is proper protocol. If you are a different group of people and you're coming into somebody else's territory as a native, you're supposed to get permission to do so. So when they called and wanted us to give them permission, absolutely. We went and performed for them. Our kids rocked that place. The grandmothers actually blessed each of our children. It was a great day. Great day. This is the late Chief Blackie Lampman. He was a good man, um, working together to make a better life for our children. Blackie was all about education. He really wanted the kids to be educated so that they could have more and get more out of life. And um, so that is late Chief Blackie. So this is Mrs. Goy Burial Grounds in Sacred Lands. I can't see what time it is. I say in a couple of minutes, we're going to take a break. So Mrs. Goy Burial Grounds, we're going to go into this. This is going to be a little bit more in depth. So I say we take a 10, 15 minute, just get up, stretch your legs, whatever, and whatever you want to do, all right? And we'll come back to this. So this used to be um, at the end of the Monument Road in Swanton. It's not there anymore. So I was like, I said to Jeff, he got in the van and we went for a ride one day and I took him down and I said, it's gone, where'd it go? So they're in the process of doing something to replace it because they're gonna make the road different so it won't be there, but it'll still be, because I'm like, where did that go? Because that's like us. This is all about us. So it'll be in English and in Abenak. Yep. All right. So the Missisquoi burial grounds and sacred lands. 1790 to 1860, Missisquoi in Abenaki Chiefs burial mound reported destroyed in Highgate, Vermont. 1860s, Abenaki burial ground looted in Highgate, Vermont. 1922 to 1938, ancient Missisquoi flint mine looted and destroyed in Vermont. How many didn't know there was a flint mine in Swanton? We are the people of the flint. That is what Missisquoi means, land of the flint. 1959 to 1960, Isle Lamont burial looted by William Ritchie, all known burial repatriated in 1994. Not that it took 34 to 35 years to receive the stuff to put it back. 1973, bushy, bushy uh, burial ground in Highgate, excavated during a house construction. A UVM anthropology department looted, reported remains and grave goods repatriated in 1992. 1974 to 1977, Abenaki Nation merges that all burial grounds and sacred places should be left in peace and all looted burials and graves goods should be repatriated. That's been a fight for our people forever. They didn't see ours as a burial ground, as a cemetery. They didn't see it as anything of that. They saw nothing of it. And then if you found a body, you had to find two to three to consider that it would be anything. If you found one, one and a half, weren't enough. You had to have at least two. <clears throat> so just real quick on that. Do, do people know what this was? This is one of the most uh, important things that happened more recently around the area. Someone on my road was putting a twin wall. No, the foundation. You, it's a yeah. foundation. And uh, he thought he had uh, 
that rock, and it was a human skull. And uh, we stopped. But what then happened was we took out uh, the eight and there's 77 remains. 77 full remains. Uh, and that began this uh, incredibly difficult period because as Brenda said before, the Abenaki have always thought that if things that uh, happen that uh, don't happen for a reason, the spirits are gonna be at uh, unrest. And when they, they, this happened, um, and they came out of the ground and all that. We literally looked at Miles Jensen dying, but then two weeks later, Dick Snelling, the guy that was, uh, uh, I said was governor, he was initially governor in 1977. He came back to be governor again. This is when uh, he became governor. He died two weeks after Miles. This is all around the, the time of what was going on with their remains. Because he died and Howard Dean became governor. Uh, and that's when the Governor's Advisory Commission on Native American Affairs started, and, uh, and I was the chair. I only mention that because the state would not work with the Abenaki. So here we have 77 remains that have been disinterred, and um, the state is like, well, that's really too bad. Keep in mind, there were no Native American repatriation uh, 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 laws of any sort. There was nothing around the burial. So we're going to the medical examiner to try to figure out what we can do. There's nothing. The state wanted them to go in a, a site uh, in Albert. And the Abenaki are saying, well, we can't go into Albert. They belong in Swan. Monument Road was uh, home to like at least three or four of the most uh, well-known major burial sites. That's because the Abenaki historically would be uh, going uh, down the river in the summertime right on the shore of Missisquoi. So that's where they'd be a lot of deaths. Wintertime, they'd go up to Odenac, as Brenda said. So back and forth from Odenac, I mentioned that because there were a lot of times people say, we didn't see the Abenaki. Well, that's because it depended on when you were looking. Winter times, they're in Odenac. Summertime, on the shores of Missisquoi, Monument Road. So the Abenaki knew exactly where the uh, remains were, where they should go. We had already dealt with the state around two other remains, two other burials. Um, again, the state would not give it to the Abenaki. The state would not enter into anything. The state, as Homer St. Francis would say, the state was at war with the Abenaki. Howard Dean had an assistant attorney general. Uh, Bill Sorrell was his attorney general, but under Bill Sorrell was a guy named Bill Griffin. Bill Griffin was referred to as the Indian killer because he didn't want to see anything happen with the Abenaki. He convinced the legislature if the Abenaki get <coughs> recognition, it's going to lead to one. Um, land claims, land claims lead to you know them getting uh, the land, but two, the biggie for Howard Dean was around casinos. So the Abenaki get recognition. All right, now if the truth is, state recognition is nothing. It, state recognition doesn't bring in anything really, but it's federal recognition. Yes, federal recognition. It may lead to land claims. It may lead to casinos, but not necessarily. The state of Vermont was besides itself. Howard Dean said, look, I have been against uh, gaming. I feel this is a uh, regressive taxation. It preys on the poor. Um, so Jeff, there's no way I'll be in favor of doing anything with the Abenaki. This is when I became the chair of this commission. Homer St. Francis said, there's nothing more important to our people right now than getting the bones back in the ground. That became the most important thing. The state wouldn't deal with the Abenaki. So we had to go to the legislature um, the guy that's uh, still Bill Chaffee, um, who's from the cult. We dealt with people from Colchester. We dealt with folks all over. The bottom line is they didn't want to hear it. So what they kept saying is, let's put the remains in Albert. And we kept saying, but they don't belong in Albert. It wasn't until we started talking about, if these were your grandparents' remains, if they were your grandparents, would you be okay with them coming out of the earth and then being shipped somewhere? And they said, well, no. But that's when we started the conversation. But to the Abenaki, time is looked at differently. 10,000 years is not looked at the same way it's looked for us. And with that began this first earnest conversation, and the legislators got it. So what they said is the Senate institutions, they said, OK, what is it going to cost us to put them where, they remain, where the remains should go? Well, the people that own the house, John and Edith Boucher, they heard that the state was interested, and they were like, we're ready to sell the place. It was appraised at $170,000. They put it on the market, $300,000. Howard Dean is like, there's no way we're going to spend that. But it's like, that's what they put it on. They knew the state was involved. They figured they had the state. 
right? I go back to the legislature, we're dealing with them. They said, you come up with half the money and we'll pay the other half. So this is $300,000. We'll pay 150, you pay 150,000. Well, where are we gonna get 150,000 dollars from? We don't have any money uh, to speak of. Um, what happened was a guy named Paul Brune, who just passed last year, Paul Brune was the executive director of, of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, a really, really good friend of the Abenaki. He calls me up and he said, I've got someone who wants to walk the property with you on Monument Road. I said, sure. We walk the property, the guy sees where the burial is supposed to be. We come back to my office and he said, I'm writing you a check. So he writes a check and I said, wow, this is 1992, 93, a check for $1,500, which I thought was great. Well, it wasn't. Paul said, check, look again. So I did and I said, wow, it's $15,000. That's really something. Well, I'll make a long story short, it wasn't. This guy wrote a check for $150,000 with the understanding that if he ever became known that this had to be completely confidential, his anonymity had to be something that I assured him uh, that it would stay anonymous. Anyway, we were able to take a check for $150,000, bring it to the legislature and say, we have our $150,000, what about you? They emptied up their $150,000. The Abenaki then took the remains, which by this time were down in Burlington, and two canoes went up the Missisquoi. It took a couple of weeks, it was almost uh, two weeks, that it took to bring the bones up, which they did, uh, and then it had to be done in the middle of the night because the Abenaki were concerned with grave robbers. If people hear that there's a graveyard, right away they're concerned about what? That uh, people are gonna be stealing Flint, they're gonna be stealing, they're gonna be stealing all kinds of things. So this was done in the middle of the night. The 77 remains were put back in the ground. Now the legislature says, um, and this I'm just gonna share with you, they say to me, well, okay, so the $300,000, that's not gonna take care of all of it though, right? What about, and I said, well, what about what? And he said, what about a picket fence or something that's gonna denote that here's the cemetery. And they were thinking in terms of like Memorial Day, you would go to a, a graveyard, right? And put your flowers down and, and it made sense. But I said, that's not the way the Abenaki look at it. In fact, if we do something like that, there'll be people coming all over the place. The Abenaki don't want anything um, that will be done that anybody would know. The only thing they want is a, a line, a boundary of hardwood trees that will denote for them where it is. Because what the state did, again, Howard Dean would not give the Abenaki the land because that would be tacit recognition. And Howard Dean was not gonna recognize the Abenaki. No way, no how. So he named the Abenaki, the quote unquote, the stewards of the land in perpetuity. So the Abenaki, and they are to this day, the stewards of the land in perpetuity. The bones went back, um, legislature emptied up the money, and here we are. Now, since that time, um, all kinds of laws were passed, Native American repatriation laws. Uh, we've worked with uh, medical examiners. I mean, a lot has changed from then, but it brought out for us just how bad things were and also uh, where things were at with Howard Dean as a governor. It's one of the three distinct cultural groups, Anglo, French Canadian, and Abnaki. In recent years, the tribe has sought federal recognition, a struggle which has intensified after the discovery that parts of Swanton cover ancient Abnaki burial grounds. In 1973, on this road, Monument Road, um, the Boucher family rose digging for a cellar hole. While they were digging, um, the excavator had put a pile of dirt out of the, out of the cellar hole and a skull rolled down. It was with that discovery, quite accidental, that we learned that uh, this was an extremely important and complex uh, burial site that contained uh, the remains of uh, several generations of Native Americans who had been placed there uh, from time to time under uh, different circumstances, but placed there with respect. And what was occurring, of course, was not an intentional, but an accidental, unintentional interruption of their resting place. I don't feel that we need federal recognition, but if, if that's going to stop um, all these uh, burials that are being dug up and going to give us our rights to hunt and fish and the rights that we're born with, then I guess... So that's Ch Chief April St. Francis Merrill. Um, women don't do repatriation. 
It's not what we do. Men do that. And we believe, native wise, if women do that, it become, you become sterilized. It takes away the right to be able to bear children. So when April only had one child because she was so part of repatriation of putting all those children, one was a whole mound of babies that we had to put back. And Jeff talks about repatriation, but there's a lot that goes to that. It's putting the bones to the right person back. It's putting them back together and then wrapping them and putting them back to the ground. There's a whole process that goes to that. It's not just throwing the bones in a pile and covering them up. It's putting them back respectively. In 17, 1977 to 1981, Giovanna Peebles, first Vermont state archaeologist to agree to no survey digging and to repatriated all native remains and grave goods to state custody. 1979 and 1980, protocol developed the implement of the T Vermont Division of Historic Preservation and Burial Discoveries of Vermont, including contacting Abenaki Tribal Council for proper care and reburial of native remains. 1990-1992 Vermont burial law changed to include unmarked, unmarked burials. So we fought until 1992 to get that. This is some lands, um, sacred land. It's Grandma Lampman's Preserve. It's at the Maquam in Swanton. Um, it's got 872 acres. It is a lot of marsh and um, wetlands. The blueberries there are amazing. But we tell people, if you don't know the area, don't go in it. Because you go in, you're going to get lost, and you're never going to find your way out. And most people know that. So native people, we know the area. We go in. We can. It's grown up so much, and I haven't done it. I'd probably get lost myself now. But years ago, we knew it like the back of our hand. Mrs. Goy Burial Grounds, again, 1996 and 1998, Dartmouth College repatriates the first Abenaki remains through the NACPRA process, the Abenaki Nation of Mrs. Goy and the Abenaki Nation Coalition. 2000, Mrs. Goy Burial Grounds disturbed by the Boucher House construction in Highgate in Vermont. Abenaki recover remains and grave goods for reburial. Seven stones unearthed in 1980 and returned to tribal. Stones were put up for auction by the Boucher family on the Duane Merrill and Company's auction website. Abenaki communities and state employees in the Division of Historic Preservations rushed to stop the sale before March 30th. The PTV made arrangements with the Boucher family and Dwayne Merrill to secure the Abenaki artifacts. Now they sold their house and made $300,000 off it, and then they have our artifacts, and that wasn't enough. So they had to sell that also. And we got notice of it. We were just going into a PAC meeting when Jeff received this. So we had to scramble to figure out, and they would not take them off. They had to have $10,000, and they would not give them to us until they received their money. This is not that long ago. I mean, that Wayne Merrill did the auction, and that uh, that's what they wanted, ten thousand uh, dollars for the uh, after the artifacts. Abenaki remains lie in Alberg. This was another one. It took seven years. So 2000, 2007, Alberg Abenaki burial ground disturbed and finally pro protected in place with the state of Vermont acquiring the land. Seven years because they found only one, and then they found a second, and then after they found the third, then they had something to go more on. So it's a whole process which people don't understand, which makes no sense even to us. Um, this, is, um, a, this is down at the end of the Monument Road. If you ever get down the end of Monument Road, this talks about, this was given to us, the people of Swanton by the, by the Abenaki Nation, and it just talks about um, what our totem is, the turtle, the otter, things like that. But it's just, and that was what got us. So they had state monuments, state recognized things on us, but we weren't really here. So it's all the things that kind of go together that makes our head spin. So this is the state historical Missisquoi village and the first Jesuit mission of Vermont. That's the end of Monument Road. In the 1940s, 1950s, there was a flood. When the flood came in, it divided the land. It used to be all one that went over. Now it's divided. So when they talked about that, feet, that bank, the outer bank, that is where it detached from the first uh, the first um, village of Missisquoi. So, and when they talked about the, uh, the refuge, that's 5,831 acres that was taken from us, that we were not allowed and still not allowed to take the wild rice, 
stuff that our people eat all the time, not in being able to get the blueberries and the raspberries and all the things that our people are so used to doing under federal law, you weren't allowed to do such a thing. If the Abenaki ever got federal recognition, if they did, that's a piece of property. So people always hear about all this land and this and that. And uh, in this case, if the Abenaki got a federal recognition, the Missisqua, what they would get uh, is the wildlife record. Right. This is just some letters. It's hard for you to see them. Um, but I just put them up so that they're natural resources. And um, some of that stuff you guys have and some's over there. Another letter, another letter. Remembering Chief Homer St. Francis. He is the one that started everything. If it wasn't for Homer St. Francis, we, the Abenaki, Missisquoi, Nelhegan, El Nu, or Kawasuk, would be nowheres. Because Homer was the man who had the voice. He didn't care what people thought of him. He knew what he had to do for his people. And he cared about his people. So he had a big voice, and he was a big man. And people were scared to death of Homer. I wasn't scared of Homer. He treated me with respect. I treated him with respect. But there were people that were scared of him, and some white people probably were, ought to been. The burial. He was the largest uh, funeral the state of Vermont has ever seen, ever. Chief Homer was carried in his coffin throughout the streets. They let him, and everybody, and I say this all the time, no harm to Jeff, everybody that's anybody at Missisquoi or the state of Vermont were there. Jeff was in St. Kitts teaching, so he couldn't get back in time for everything. So Jeff wasn't part of that, but it was the biggest. This church here was full. People were outside. There was not enough room for everybody. Was not enough room. There was thousands of people there. It was the largest thing I've ever seen in my life. Howard Dean was scared about coming. Now, this is the chief. This is the, the seminal person um, in the last 50 years, right at Homer St. Francis. I get a call in St. Kitts from uh, Howard Dean's uh, legal counsel. And uh, he says, Jeff, so here's the deal. The governor wants to go, but uh, is he going to be safe? And I'm like, well, is he going to be safe? What do you mean, is he going to be safe? This is Homer's funeral. What do you mean, safe? He wants a guarantee from you that he'll be safe. And I said, well, I, I'm in the British West Indies. I, I, I'm in St. Kitts. I can't tell you much of anything other than, of course he'll be safe. And it would be something that uh, the family, as well as the community, uh, would take great exception to if Howard Dean didn't come to Homer St. Francis' funeral. So he says to me, can you call up the family? So I did. I called up uh, and I spoke to his widow, Patsy St. Francis. I said, Patsy, is uh, Governor Dean going to be okay if he comes to the funeral? And she thought I was kidding. I said, I'm not kidding. Is he going to be okay? And she said, of course he's going to be okay. Um, and as a result, Howard Dean did go. He attended Homer's funeral. That was a big deal in the sense that... I didn't put his picture in. Mm -hmm. I had it. I have his picture with Patsy, and I didn't put it in. I refused to. Right. But for him, it was a big deal, after all. He came to a home. They weren't a big deal to any of us in Abenaki of Missisquoi, but. Instrumental, the unification of the Abenaki was Homer St. Francis, a hulking, benign man with a crew cut and penetrating but gentle eyes. To look at him as he sits slumped in his chair in the reconverted railroad warehouse that is the Abenaki tribal headquarters is to watch your preconception of the feather headdress Indian take to the swift nose dive into oblivion. To talk to him is to begin to understand the curious process of the assimilation that transforms a per people's physical appearance, yet leaves their spirit, spiritual parts untouched. When the Indians told me the land was given to them by God, I told them I couldn't find where he registered the deed, Governor Snelling. In a private meeting with the Abenaki chief, Governor Snelling got all red and slammed his hand down on the table. He didn't intimidate Homer at all. In 1976, he won state recognition for the tribe by then Governor Thomas Salmon. Yet, just three months later, newly elected Governor Richard Snelling rescinded the order. Under Chief Blackie, 
The tribe has applied for federal recognition with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So um, the state that you heard, Jeff told you that anyhow. In May in 1993, Governor Howard Dean proclaimed the Abenaki present for 10,000 years as the seminal in the Vermont history. In May 6, 2006, Governor Douglas signed into law S-117, a bill to recognize Abenaki, which was useless. That bill, you could have wiped your butt with it and flushed it, is about as good as it was. My people could not sell their arts and crafts. If they did, they could go to jail up to five years and up to a $5,000 fine if they said they were Abenaki. So the language had to be changed, which took from 2006 to 2012. Another six years to get language correct. So May 7th of 2012, the St. Francis Sokoki Band received state recognition by Governor Peter Shumlin. We didn't have it because of language. Yes. People who were not state recognized could not sell their wares. This is right. So think about this. They cannot sell their wares as made by Native American. You can't do that. So the only ones who can sell something as Native made are if you're coming from a state recognized or federally recognized tribe. As Brenda said, um, that's what the penalty is. So one of the things with state recognition, I said there wasn't much that was going to come with it. Right? And there wasn't. It's not like there was land or this or that. Most of all, what people were looking for, especially in Cisco, uh, was here. It was as Blackie used to say, we want it, we want to feel it here. We know we're Abenaki in our hearts, but our kids are continually uh, harassed. Uh, they're bullied on the playgrounds. If you were really Indian, why doesn't the state of Vermont recognize you? And what do kids say? If you're really Indian, why doesn't the state recognize you? And there was no ready answer. So. That's what it was about. It was so that the kids, and it was always about the kids. It was also for us to be able to get scholarships. So well, scholarships, which is huge. That's why we developed a scholarship guide. There were all kinds of scholarships for state recognized tribes. Because to try to convince the legislature that this was not about money, this was something far less tangible, but it was about something that was esoteric. But to the Abenaki, it was so important. The idea of finally having the recognition so that kids could go on the playground and they could be proud of who they were. Um, not that they weren't, because we were already doing all kinds of things to uh, help youngsters along. But in any case, um, it was really, really important that, right? I mean, that in terms of the state recognition. So what was it? If you made something, so Brenda makes a basket, it had to say, made by Brenda Gunnett. So I remember the first time I said, well, Brenda, you do all kinds of stuff. How come it doesn't say, made by Brenda Guyon, uh, Abenaki? And then she told me, and it was like, oh my God. So this is where we thought, and we thought we had the right language. To go in front of the national, this is at a federal level, the Arts and Crafts Board, which determines the yay and nay in terms of the language that you've got. We messed up. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I screwed up, and uh, there were a couple of us, we, we, we messed up on it. So we thought that people would be able to say that they had, uh, we had state recognition, and with it, they'd be able to uh, do the, uh, uh, say that they uh, made by Abenaki. We thought that simply by having state recognition, that in itself would allow Abenaki to say that this is made by Abenaki. We were wrong, right? So uh, we didn't realize that the native, the Arts and Crafts Board had to say that the language of state recognition was going to allow for the provision that made by Abenaki. And as Brenda said, this took a couple of years because the language, uh, it was something that we couldn't get it right because, again, governor's offices were like, they were all over it. What is this going to lead to? Now understand when Blackie, when they talk about Blackie uh, going for federal recognition, we couldn't go for federal recognition for the longest time. Everything that was done, we had to do when the time was right. We didn't want to put in for federal recognition because uh, Strom Thurmond was a senator of South Carolina. Strom Thurmond was head of the uh, uh, Department of the Interior. Uh, so the, the Interior was, was responsible for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was responsible for yay, yay, nay, for federal recognition. Strom Thurmond said, on my watch, over my dead body, is anyone going to get recognition? Nobody's going to get federal recognition. And the truth is, nobody did. So Strom Thurmond is saying that we didn't want to put it in. We wanted to hold it back. We couldn't. Um, time was such, we had to put it in. Uh, we didn't get it. Um, and then we needed to go and, and do some revisions. But again, 
the state language, we finally got it right. That allowed people like Brenda and all kinds of folks to be able to say, finally, made by Abenaki Indian cat, you know, a, a basket maker, made by Abenaki, made by Mississippi, made by. You know, and we're the only people in this country that have to do that also. You can be African American and sell your product and be African American all you want. But if you're Native American, you cannot do anything. They control everything that we do or want to do. This is a picture of Blackie. It says, bury my heart in Swan. This was in August of 1978. And the Abenaki Indians fight to be recognized. He was a very quiet man. Blackie was quiet. Homer was loud. But they both had their good parts. The date in history, American Indians gained citizenship, June 2nd, 1924, and that wasn't for all, because there are still people that can't vote in the United States of America, which we call Turtle Island, because if you live on a reservation, you do not have a legal post office box or address. So if you live on a reservation, that is sovereign land. It is not even thought of by the United States. So I live on a reservation. I lived on Route 36 or whatever in Hogansburg. That is not a legal address to a US mailbox. So there are people who live on res reservations in this country that still are not allowed to vote in this country. This is State Recognition Day that we brought our kids and they performed in front of the State House. I myself never in my life would have ever thought this could happen. State recognition. This was at our powwow we used to have in the Swanton Park. And Alliance Chiefs perform a ceremony and appreciation for the legislatures who went above and beyond to support the Vermont Abenaki tribes of Missisquoi, Nohegan, Kawasuck, and El Nu. Left to right is Chief Luke Willard, Chief April Merrill, Senator Hinda Miller, and we gave them um, uh, honorary blankets and stuff. And that's how we show our honor. If we, if we honor you of something you've done really well for our people, I received a blanket years ago for all the work I do with the children for the youth, which is an honor. To, to get a blanket, that's the biggest honor you can get from your nation. And whether Hinda Miller understood that or not, we're not for sure, but we knew what it meant. <laughs> So this was our first Indigenous Peoples Day. It was October 6 of 2016. Now it is in place forever, we hope, we pray. Um, we would like, so when we got this, everybody was excited and I'm like, what's one day? We're, we're recognized one day of the year, but we take that one day and we go to the schools and we perform and we do so that we're out there, so that they're learning and they're having a little bit more. Alberg, uh, the islands just passed Indigenous Peoples Day for this year coming, so they will be in school this year. So our ride with the van's gonna be a little longer. So we'll be doing the islands and then we'll be working our way to Swanton, Highgate, Franklin, and MVU, because we celebrate with them. Because no other school district in the state of Vermont. We were the only one. That, again, understand the difference. We're saying that if um, we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, kids need to learn about it. We tried to have that argument around Mark Luther King Day. I mean, the idea is kids get to stay off, and what does it mean to them? So we thought, let it be a day of celebration. Let kids begin to learn about Indigenous people. Well, 
easier said than done. And uh, as Brenda said, we started doing this two years ago um, in Mississippi Valley School District. Now the islands are doing it. We're hopeful that uh, uh, certainly in Franklin County that uh, we'll be seeing within the next year or two that every school in Franklin County will be open. So it's the idea that schools will be open to celebrate the one day. You know, this 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 one day. Um, it's not easy. My daughter's on the school board in Alberg, and she really pushed the islands to do this. And I don't know if it would have done it without her pushing as much as she did. So kudos to her. She's like her mother. She doesn't keep her tongue in her pocket too much. Here's some list of boarding schools. There are so many in this country that I could not believe. Vermont does not have any. But as I said, we had our own. We had the Warner home where our kids were put. We had St. Joseph's Orphanage, our kids were put. The State Mental Hospital, our children were put. Our kids were put at the Weeks home. They were everywhere because our people were poor. And God forbid they couldn't read or write. So, Carlisle School, everybody knows about the Carlisle School pretty much because that's the one they talked about the most. And that was an army base, which is still hard to get into. We went down there this year and I could not get in. It is patrolled by the army. And um, Mel was actually was one who snuck in and got in, but a lot of us, they turn you away, which I have a problem with. I don't care if it's army or not. Those are our people. In 1873, the American government killed 1.5 million buffalo in that year alone to starve the Native Americans so they'd become more dependent on the American government to survive. This I put in, this is on the Canadian bounty. Um, it shows the mother trying to save her child from the priest and the nuns as they were being taken. Now let me tell you, we had choice. People don't think we had a choice. My people had a choice. Choice to go to jail, choice to be sterilized, or a choice to have your children taken from you. We did have choice. We weren't the right choice, but we did have choice. This breaks my heart. I saw this and had to put it up. It's um, when they buried the children, what they didn't know, they were lovingly embraced by the land, held and cradled in a mother's heart. The trees wept for them. The wind, they sang morning songs their mother didn't know how to sing. Bending branches to touch the earth around them. The creator cried for them, and the tears falling like rain. Mother Earth held them until they could be found. Now our voices sing in morning songs. With the trees, the wind, the lit, slight sacred fire, ensure that they are never forgotten as we sing for justice. We're up to almost 12,000 bodies found right now. After the four or 500 years of massacres, exile, reservations, broken treaties, boarding schools, small plots, blankets, poisoned rations, religious persecution, alcohol, prison, hazardous waste, we are still here. This is on Henry Perkins. I don't blame Henry Perkins completely for what he did to the state of Vermont and our people. I blame his father, George. George Perkins was an animal. They owned property on the Monument Road in Swanton, Vermont, if that doesn't surprise you at all. And what they did was, when George would go for his summer home, he would go out into the woods and he would go and loot our burial grounds. He would steal from our people that were already dead. And Henry was with him. So Henry was taught by his father to be the malicious man that he is, or was. And if it wasn't for Henry Perkins, we wouldn't have had eugenics in the state. He's the one who pushed for the law. So the United States during the progressive era, 1890 to 1920, was the first country to constantly undertake compulsory sterilization programs for the purpose of eugenics. 33 states participated in eugenics. National Trust of Historic Preservation, the Eugen Vermont Eugenics Survey in 1925 and the Sterilization Law of 1931, which intended to angelize the state's population identified as Abenaki is undesirable. Vermont is unaware of how many natives were sterilized. UVM cannot tell me. They don't know for sure. The three Ds of eugenics, defective and defect. Delinquency, dependency, and dependent. If you were under any of those three, you are automatically considered to be under eugenics, to be sterilized, your children taken from you. 
The making of a eugenics started in Swanton, Vermont, when Henry Perkins was a young boy. In the 1880s, Perkins would spend summers in his family's home in Swanton, Vermont, during which Perkins and his father would take trips to the woods and collect Indian bones and artifacts from archaeological sites and survey ge geological formations. Without Henry Perkins, Vermont most likely would not have been part of eugenics, for it was for him who brought it to the state of Vermont. You guys all know, you hear, you hear the name Perkins, you know the name Henry Perkins? Is that something? Uh, because he was a zoologist in UVM. He was a zoologist. So I remember a time when Homer had went out and they had the door held open in the zoology department with a human head. It was a skull. And Homer refused to go in because we were for sure that head belonged to one of our people. But he was part of zoology and um, he was a sick man. And he had the people that actually went out in the field were his students. <laughs> he started off with students going out in the field to find the D's of these people. So what happened? In 1995, I got a call from uh, Greg Sanford. Greg Sanford, uh, <laughs> people know the state archivist. Uh, I think he still is, he might be. He calls up and he said, we've got boxes here. We don't know what they are in Montpelier. And we want to get rid of them. But he said, I started going through them and I saw Na Abenaki surnames. So I thought you might want to take a look at them. I went down to Montpelier. I brought one box guy to Homer St. Francis. And um, he said, we're not ready to deal with this. Get rid of it. And I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, get rid of the boxes. We're not ready to deal with it. Um, a couple years later, he said, OK. At the same time that he's saying, OK, University of Vermont is going to start to come to terms with their role in eugenics. And uh, an art professor uh, decided to do his rendition of Henry Perkins's study. Um, and at the Fleming Museum, um, we had this exhibit, and it was pretty amazing. The important thing about it, we went down, and nobody knew exactly what to expect, but it was incredibly sobering because what uh, this art teacher uh, professor did, behind a rolltop desk, he had a blackboard, and a blackboard with the, uh, the uh, classification of how it is that people would be um, sterilized. And what you saw was the first, it was IQ. So Alfred Binet, B-I-N-E-T, had come to the United States 1900 and said that it's, Binet's intelligence test should not be used for sorting. It should not be used for sorting. The first thing we did was to use it for sorting in the military um, and so that people could be tested and divided into the, the grunts, the officers. In any case, Perkins's, uh, behind Perkins's desk, you've got anyone with an IQ under 65, that's sterilization. Then it talks about uh, people with disabilities, but it talks about uh, people retarded. It talks about people who are mixed bloods, gypsies, Indians. And then it just goes on and you realize, wow, this is what was going on. You go around and what they then had was a gynecological table that came right from the week school. Okay, so the week school is where it's still a lot of sterilization was going on. As Brenda said, people had a choice. Most people didn't even know what was going on. So they didn't understand necessarily what the choices were, but they went with sterilization better than going to jail, right? So they, they're like, okay, we'll do it, and they were sterilized. But in any case, the last thing you saw when you're walking out of the exhibit, under glass, there were letters, three letters. The first one was written by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. Now, Dorothy Canfield Fisher was the poet, a poet laureate of the state of Vermont for years and years and years. Um, Dorothy Canfield Fisher was the first one. You've got to remember the time and the context of when this was happening. The 1920s, when the second wave of immigration is really hot and heavy. In Vermont, it was profound. In Burlington, for instance, the uh, Jews that are coming in, the Jewish, uh, the peddlers, Megrams, uh, the uh, grocers, Kalani's Market, the Jews coming in, the Irish are coming in, the Italian, Italian going to Barry, um, you know, for the uh, grant for the uh, uh, grant milk. This is what's going on. Dr. Campbell Fisher, who's a true blood uh, Vermonter, is like, what are we going to do? This is what the state of Vermont was dealing with. And this is what everyone was dealing with. What are we going to do with all these immigrants that are coming here? It's interesting to obviously juxtapose it with today or when uh, Donald Trump was in office. But in any case, so the state of Vermont said, OK, what are we going to do? Dorothy Canfield Fisher said, this is going to be a strategy. I think what should happen, and this is exactly what happened in Vermont, twofold. One, what are we going to do with the people that are already here? 
the people that are already here, like the mixed bloods, the Abenaki, well, we're going to sterilize them. What are we going to do to keep people from coming here? How are we going to keep it that Vermont will be seen as a place that's not desirable from outsiders, so they don't come here in the first place? And what we would say is that Vermont's done a hell of a job. I can remember us going down to the uh, a publisher, Tom Slayton, of Vermont, uh, Vermont Life magazine, and saying, why is it that every picture here is of pe people with blue eyes, blonde hair, every single uh, ski slope? And he said, look, I'm part of travel and tourism. We have to sell magazines. We sell the image. And the image we try to sell is that of blue eyed blonde hair. We're certainly not selling an image that looks like what? And he's talking about that looks like, well, if this was in New York City. Vermont was very, very intentional in saying that we don't want people coming here. And if you, you know, fast forward to today, what well, you realize, like, holy shit, Vermont's done a pretty good job. What's the percentage um, of Vermont? What is it, less than 1% in terms of uh, people that are uh, not, uh, not mine? I mean, it's unbelievable. But in any case, second letter is written. So first we see the one done again for Fisher. The second one was written by Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Plant Parenthood. So she wrote the letter, again, supporting Henry Perkins, all that he was doing. The third letter was written in German. This is 1927. The letter written in German is written by whom? It's written by Adolf Hitler to Henry Perkins, saying that uh, he admired all that Henry Perkins was doing to keep up the good work, and they would maintain their correspondence, which they did until the early 1930s. So there's Henry Perkins maintaining the correspondence with Adolf Hitler. And you know this, this was the context of the state of Vermont. So Dr. Kanfer Fisher, Margaret Sanger, and Adolf Hitler. Um, and Vermont, as Brenda said, um, was one of the states, only 30 some odd states in the country, but was one of the states that passed sterilization laws. In New England, uh, we were the most virulent in terms of what was going on. New Hampshire, Maine, um, it was nothing like what was going on in Vermont. Vermont did a really good job, so to speak, in terms of rounding the peoples up. And they had the Abenaki, so that was easy. So what happened was, all those names that uh, that I was brought in great effort brought to me, we started looking at them, and we realized these were all Abenaki surnames. So you start seeing the St. Francis's, you start seeing the Latins, you see the names, and it's like, oh my God, and then you start to realize what this was all about, and what eugenics was all about. And I'm saying this today, because the state of Vermont only last year, as you know, the legislature, um, passed an apology for what the state legislature did around sterilization. So Tom Stevens was the lead sponsor of Waterbury, and it was great, you know, that they passed the law. The next thing, though, because we said, okay, you pass something that apologizes for sterilization, but next up, what is it going to be? And that's around education. And what you're going to see this year is uh, around the truth and reconciliation. And truth and reconciliation will be, how does the state of Vermont come to terms with those people that are wronged? This has been done in places like South Africa. It's been done in Canada. Um, how is Vermont going to deal with truth and reconciliation? The truth of what was done to people and then the reconciliation, how is it going to make up for it? So that was one of the reasons, by the way, why we thought uh, having you folks here, because this is going to come at you really quickly in terms of this is where we're going to be in the state of Vermont um, within a couple of months. Yep. So, thank you. This is just a letter to remind people that in 1952, you could buy a an, an Native American child for $10. And it says, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Seeley, thank you very kindly for your donation of $10 for my little Indians. You're in the first invitation that was ever extended to one of our papooses to come and spend the vacation somewhere. We have a few little boys and girls who have no one at all interested, whether they live or die or come and go. I would like to send a little boy of six years or older or a little girl, whatever you prefer. These Indian children are very little trouble, especially the one I have in mind. If you really men mean it, I will see and get you one ready. You may have him any time you desire. I'm not making any inquiries about you because it is. it takes a good person to make an offer as you did. Please let me know. 
ten dollars. Um, it's the Takathawa Indian Mission, Where? South Dakota. This is Vermont sterilization statistics, which aren't complete, completely truthful. So it says before 1931, six, 1933, 30, and it talks about how many men, how many females, and it goes down to here. So they're saying it's five, 600 people, roughly, is what they're saying. And they cannot give me a complete count because they have no idea for sure. This is that dirty man. This is Henry Perkins, the zoologist professor. This is Margaret Sanger that Jeff got ahead of it and, and does that on me. But this is, uh, she, she was the birth control activist and educator and a nurse. This is the author, Dorothy Canfield Fisher. I didn't know if everybody knew who the faces of them and stuff, so I always try to make sure people can see who they are. That we're not gonna do today because it's gonna take too long. Get out of here. So this is the Long Shadows ex exhibit that I was saying earlier a little bit about. So this was done at the Fleming Museum, and um, it's Michael Oatman. I don't remember her name, but I remember her, his. These are pictures of some of our people, actually, and different things in, that he, they had set up when you went in to his whole exhibit in 1995. What amazes me is this is George, his father, and this is a native that belongs to our people. And it's funny that he has his back to our native person. I just find that there's always something when people do things, there's a reason why they do that. Because if you would have thought about it, I probably would have put it the other way, but you know. But I like native people. These are some of the test tubes and stuff that they had on exhibit. Their genealogical car chart, you guys have a small one. It took up a whole wall. It was a whole wall that they had, and it showed the difference of them. Whether you're a man, a woman, feeble-minded, subnormal, if you're a part of the industrial school, if you're an intelligent, former uh, virgins, and these are all things that were very important. Alcoholic, now I don't know how many kids were alcoholics back in the day, but it must be in 1920s and 30s they had a problem with alcoholism. And they must have been all criminals because these little three and four year olds that were taken, they had to have done something terrible because he's got it marked. I'm being sarcastic, of course. This is the Vermont State Hospital. This is a picture. This building is not there anymore. That's the one that burnt down. And I can't find a better picture. If somebody ever comes across it, please email it to me or whatever. So our kids were put in the Vermont State Hospital, not because they had mental problems, because they had no other place to put them. The Warner home would have been full. The Weeks home would have been full. Everything would have been full. So they put our people there, people from our tribe I know personally. This is St. Joseph's, one of the worst places ever in the state of Vermont. The horror stories I've heard from my elders are to make my breath come out. That they would have to lay on their left side at night and the nuns would go in and poke them in their spine. And if they weren't on their left side, they would beat them with that stick. And the reason for it is because if they peed, they wouldn't pee on the bed. The boys would pee to the floor. So that's why that was. I was also told that third story, some of my people have seen where the nuns have thrown children out them. It's documented with the cases that's going on in the court in the state of Vermont, the horror stories that are actually out there. But to hear my people say it, it's even worse. And that there were children being born. And if they were born with a deficiency or something wrong with them, they threw them into the, the boiler of the furnace. And that's how they got rid of the children after they were born from the young girls that they raped. They were forced to eat their own vomit. They were dangled upside down out the windows, over wells and in laundry chutes. This is all that's come out also within the court case against St. Joseph's. So you can read up on that. I don't know whose name's gonna be on what. I know who my people are that told me the same stories that I'm reading now in that's been going on. They said they saw nuns kill children This is the Warner home, the Chauncey Warner home. They would take our children and I found my family here that I didn't know anything about. And when I talked to my uncle who's 94, he said, oh yes, he said they took them. He said, but we don't talk about it because we were afraid they'd come and take more of us. 
So they considered them to be inmates at the age of two, three, four, and five. It's supposed to be a home for wanderers. Wanderers mean an orphanage. My family had family. They had mothers, they had fathers, they had aunties, they had uncles, they had grandparents. Our people would have taken care of our own, but for some reason, they thought we weren't good enough to do it. Um, the institution played a role in eugenics movement. 1925, Henry Perkins, professor of zoology at the University of Vermont, or organized the eugenic survey of Vermont as an injunct of the hereditary course. Its mission was to conduct eugenics research, educate the public about the results of the research, and provide support to social legislation that would reduce the apparent growing population of Vermont's social problem group. Professor Pro, uh, Perkins reported brought his hereditary class to Vermont Industrial School for field work in eugenics. And many of the eugenic surveys geologists also say the degenerate families originated in family at this um, institution. So he went to there and he did his own on our people. Groups targeted, of course, were the poor, socially. The Abenaki were also a group affected by the Vermont eugenics program. And while, according to Paul, the last noted sterilization in Vermont occurred in 1957. Between 1973 and 1976, approximately 3,400 Native American women, according to the General Accounting Office, were sterilized in the United States without properly obtaining consent. So when they say eugenics was done in the 30s and 40s, no, sorry. It went on until 1976. I put that on there. I think that's important because that was taken right out of the history of Vermont for it. I just took that little blurb out, put it into the slideshow because they said gypsies, they said the boat people, and they talked about the Abenaki. We're all three. <laughs> Our people were gypsies because they didn't stay in one spot. They would take a wigwam and go from Missisquoi, and they'd go down to Winooski, which is the Onion River. Why? Because the Onion River and Lamoille River unthaws before Missisquoi does. So they'd go hunt and fish down there, and then they'd move back this way. So that's what they considered gypsies. People that lived on the boats were our people who were fishermen. So they put them in three different areas. It was one. It was our own. That's the third annual report of eugenics. You can get that online. Now, the University of Vermont has it. You can get it, and that's from 1929. And they do have a fourth, and they have a fifth also. It says, when Europe showed up in North America, indigenous people were not nomads. Not few, not savage, not impoverished, not recent immigrants, and we're not looking for salvation. Yes, indigenous people had com commerce, travel, econom economics, yeah, permanency, stewardship, inheritances, artistry, drama, ceremony, mourning, health care, political, politics, justice, penis, peacekeeping, and still do. I love this quote because everybody knows who Martin Luther King Jr. is. He said, our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine of the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shores, the scar of racial hatred had already been disfigured. Colonial society, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In history of colonization, there's always given us two options. Give up your land or go to jail. Give up your rights or go to jail. And now give up our water or go to jail because our people are fighting for water in this country because the water out west is terrible where they keep putting the pipelines through and it's tearing the waters apart. And what people don't realize is we have less than 1% sustainable water left in this world. That's scary because the next two generations from now is not going to have water. <coughs> Floyd Westerman, he's Lakota First Nation. I would like to quote the very prejudicial doctrine that was handed down the Supreme Court in 1823. It said that the Indian nations do not have the title to their lands because they weren't Christian. That was the first Christian nations to discover an area of the heathen lands has <clears throat> the absolute title. The doctrine should withdrawn and renounced, renounced to establish a new basis for a relationship between indigenous people and other people of the world. 
This is a picture of the Carlisle School. The most kids that went to the Carlisle School was from Aquasasne, right, in, in uh, Hogansburg, New York. They had the most amount of children. There was almost 500 children that were taken from that one reserve brought to that place. And I have a couple of books from the people that survived. If you ever want to read a good book, the ones I have up, Sugar Falls um, is a really good book. There's one on birch bark. They're all about survivors from these places. And they would tie their hand. If you were left-handed, they thought you were part of the devil. So they would tie that hand till they turned black. So when you look at pictures, and I have some, you'll see some of the kids' hands. One hand is blacker than the other, darker. And that's because they were cutting off the circulation because they were trying to take the devil out of them because they used their left hand. These are actual handcuffs they used on children. And they would handcuff our children by the United States government and restrain them captor Native American children and drag them away from their families and send them to Indian boarding schools where their identities, cultures, and their rights to speak their native language were forcefully stripped away from them. Pretty sad if you think about it. American Holocaust, right here, Nadakana, Turtle Island. 100 million Native Americans were killed. <clears throat> the goal of a residential school. We instill in them the, a pronounced distaste for their native life so that they will be humiliated when reminded of their origin. When they graduate from our institutions, the children have lost everything native except for their blood, signed by the bishop. Racism 2020, live in a well. They had the whole thing going on. We had white, Latino, black, something else, and Asian. Who's something else? Us. So it goes on. CNN was deemed by Native Americans something else sparking a backlash, and it did cause a backlash. To a part where my granddaughter, who wrote a letter to CNN, and she told them exactly what she thought. Did she ever hear back from them? Nope. But she was a fifth grader. I think you did that, Ruth. Did you do that? Yep. So she said, hello, my name is Sage Gould. I'm 10 years old and I live in Vermont. My family and I were watching CNN News the other night and I saw a piece of breaking news come across the screen. It had listed races as percentages. For some reason, all races were listed except for the race that I belong in. Instead of recognizing us as Native Americans, you listed us as something else. This, it, she put mad. This is, a, remember, she's fifth grade writing. This made me feel Really sad because we're the first people of this country. We never get recognized for that. I am proud of my culture and help teach at an after school program called the Abenaki Circle of Courage. Maybe next time you could do better and recognize all races in this country. This is a Native American Awareness Month signed by Sage Gould, my granddaughter. These are things that we have a hard time with and people don't understand. It's Columbus Day. We will not celebrate that lying, thieving, rapist murderer, ever, ever. Halloween, our regalia is not a costume. We, we wear it for ceremonial purposes, not to get dressed up and make fun of. Then Thanksgiving. <laughs> we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. We don't do that. That was three days of a feast that happened that then they turned around and slaughtered our people. And Abenaki were there. Squanto belonged to the Abenaki. Squanto was there. So the Abenaki were part of the first Thanksgiving. So those are things that we don't. And, you know, the do it's all about mocking and genocide when, they do, when you do that kind of stuff and try to educate kids and parents that don't go buy po Pocahontas costume. First of all, Pocahontas Disney made, she's beautiful. Beautiful. Pocahontas wasn't beautiful. She was tattooed top to bottom. She was not beautiful like they show her and portray her, and she looks Asian. I'm sorry to say that, but Pocahontas that they have on Disney is always somebody Asian playing her. We're not Asian. We are Native, indigenous. The man who horned. <laughs> now, he went in, he got arrested when he busted into the Capitol. Then he got rights because he said he was a shaman. Not out of 500 and some odd tribes did anybody claim him to say he belonged to them. First of all, we would not do that. We would not paint our face an American flag, for one, and wear a headdress like that. That's, we would not do that. Then he goes and fights and says he's not going to eat. He goes on to starvation. What do they do? They give him better food. They give him what he wants. 
We have Leonard Peltier in prison for how many years? From the AIM, and who's not been released. And this is where we end. We are the grandchildren of the ancestors they could not kill. I hope you guys learned something today. If you have any questions, I'd be more than glad to answer them.